Knowing what was happening in Dave's personal life, when I would go back and see like what he was posting at the time, I noticed there was this inverse proportionality where the worse things were going in his personal life, the more often he was probably posting and the more oftentimes it was even kind of gauzier or more sanitized than usual. And so I think there might be an element where the personalities drawn to this line of work are like overcorrecting for something in their past or in their personal life. Welcome to the Unspeakable Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Dom. First, a couple of announcements. My personal essay and memoir writing workshop on Zoom is happening in January, and the deadline is coming up. The application deadline is December 13th. So if you're applying for that class, go to the Substack. You can find out more about it there or go to the Unspeakeasy, and it is also listed there and under the drop down menu. Although the writing class is for everybody, it is not women only. It is not an unspeakeasy offering, but it's good. December 13th is the deadline. Okay, as for the unspeakeasy retreats, I won't run through them again here, but I do need to clarify that the retreat in Louisville, Kentucky in April is April 9th through 12th. I think I misspoke a few times here and said it was the 8th through 11th. It was going to be that originally, but it turns out that there is... A total eclipse of the sun on the 8th. And uh, we don't want any competition. Cannot, as great as the unspeakeasy retreats are, cannot compete with that. So April 9th through 12th, go to theunspeakeasy.com to find out about all the retreats. And do it soon because they are filling up. They really are. Okay. This week's conversation is on a subject I'm pretty sure I've never covered here. Internet influencers. My guest, Eric Schwartzel, is a Wall Street Journal reporter who writes about the business side of the entertainment industry, and he has not covered influencers either. His recent book has to do with Hollywood and its relationship to China. But last Saturday, December 2nd, the journal published a remarkable story by Eric about the case of Rachel and Dave Hollis. They are a couple who built a multi-million dollar self-help empire on top of the very fragile foundation of their own personal lives. Dave uh, was a former Disney executive who was once totally skeptical of the whole business model, but he ended up leaving Disney to partner with his wife, Rachel, to create this Tony Robbins-like self-improvement brand. You may be familiar with Rachel's 2018 book, Girl, Wash Your Face, which was a massive bestseller. Anyway, Dave later tried to build his own brand as a health and fitness influencer after their marriage ended, and uh, he uh, ended up dying very suddenly in February 2023 with lethal amounts of cocaine, fentanyl, and alcohol in his system. Anyway, Eric came on the podcast to describe that story in more detail, and I know I just laid it out for you, but it is riveting, and he's going to take us deep into it, and also reflect on why he sees it as a parable for our time. We also talk about the kind of people who become successful influencers, what kind of people follow them, what happens when influencers use their children to promote their brands, and finally, what the rise of influencer culture says about the demise of traditional forms of entertainment. If you are hearing this right now, that means you are not a paying subscriber to The Unspeakable, in which case you'll hear the first hour of this conversation. If you want to hear the rest, and there's about half an hour more where we get into a lot of the psychological stuff, please go to megandom.substack.com and join at any level. I'm going to be doing things this way more and more, so I'd really encourage you to join the listener community now. In the meantime, here is a solid hour of my conversation about Rachel and Dave Hollis with Eric Schwartzel. Eric Schwartzel, welcome to The Unspeakable. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. You write about the business of Hollywood for The Wall Street Journal. You write a lot about the intersection, sorry to use that word, (laughs) of the financial side and sort of the art and culture of it all. And 
you're here today primarily to talk about a fascinating article that you just published. It's not about Hollywood, at least not directly, but about internet influencers. So before we go into who these people are, can you tell me why this is a story in the Wall Street Journal? How much relevance do influencers have to the business world? It's a good question. And I I thought of it as I was working on this piece. And it just so happened that this piece had really become a capsule of a lot of the themes in entertainment that I think other stories are exploring. And and the, the main subject of the story is this guy, Dave Hollis. And and we'll get into who he who he was. But the reason I thought he was particularly interesting as a case study when it came to Instagram influencers was that in his the first iteration of his career it was in what we would now consider traditional entertainment. He worked for the Walt Disney Company. And whenever I was writing his story, I thought of him as someone who had gone from traditional entertainment to what is really shaping up to be the new and in some ways preferred form of entertainment, which is following people, watching their lives unfold on Instagram as a kind of soap opera reality show. Mm -hmm. And, And the reason it's in the Wall Street Journal, I think, beyond just being a good yarn, is that this is shaping up to be pretty significant business and a significant industry. I think it's easy. I think we all have people in our own lives who are, you know, wrapped up in either like MLMs or trying to do the life coach route or something like that. And we see them losing a lot of money. MLM being multi-level marketing. Exactly. Uh, The, the, the leggings, the candles, the essential oils that, that people are, are selling. And we see a lot of failure because that's what the system's built on. But those who succeed can have significant windfalls. And so whenever you have couples like the the Chip and Joanna Gaines of the world, they can really build these, these mini empires that encompass merchandise and live events and books and really become these kind of mini moguls that are making a lot of money and getting people to spend a lot of money too. Okay, wait, sorry. Who are Chip and Joanna Gaines? This is so not in my wheelhouse. I mean, I'm, I'm really, sh- I, yeah, this, this, I remember taking you on a very strange tour that, that also feels like such a, such a deeply American tour. But Chip and Joanna Gaines have a, uh, a reality show on, on one of the home networks. And they've parlayed that into um, a magazine. They have um, basically like this, they've built some kind of um, operation, almost like its own kind of little village outside of Waco, Texas. And I'll let the, you know, parallels speak for themselves there. But they, they've really been held up as like the ultimate case study in using that combination of some kind of expertise. I think in their case, it's like home renovation and home design. And you're mixing your personal life with influencing in a way that can lead to actual real business opportunities. So they've really become the case study. And the couple that I wrote about in the journal this week, Dave and Rachel Hollis, they were following that to some degree. They had even also moved to Texas where a lot of these self-help influences are finding, you know, it really helps when you're trying to build a business like this to move to a place with no income tax and a lot of room to grow. Right. We should say that uh, Waco, Texas is where David Koresh's uh, Branch Davidian cult was, right? So we're a long way. So I, I want to talk about Dripping Springs and what, what that's like, but um, it's interesting how we've gone from Waco to Dripping Springs. Anyway, okay. So how did you stumble upon these people? Are you like somebody who follows influencers? Like what was your sort of relationship to this whole ecosystem? No, I, I don't. I don't follow influencers. I don't have like an, a particular allergy toward them. But the reason that I got onto this story was because I knew Dave Hollis when he worked at Disney. So I joined the journal about 10 years ago to cover the film industry. And in the early days of my job, one aspect of it was covering box office. So every Sunday morning, or most Sunday mornings, I would have to wake up pretty early and start looking at how movies had performed that weekend. And it's a pretty, you know, cut and paste routine after a while. And part of the routine is calling the head of distribution at the studio that had the big movie that year or that, that weekend. 
And Dave was this guy in his, then he was in his late 30s, early 40s, so significantly younger than most people in his position, running global distribution for the Walt Disney Company. So he was in charge of booking movies in theaters, figuring out when to release films. And he had this job at a time when Disney was on an unprecedented historical hot streak. They were just releasing one blockbuster after another. And in some cases, it always seemed like Dave had the easiest job in Hollywood because they were releasing movies that were such big hits that they could have premiered them at like 3 a.m. on a Tuesday and people would have shown up to see them. And so I would call him whenever Disney had a big movie out. And most of the time, the interviews would be very, very pro forma. And Disney among the studios is definitely the one that trains its executives to be the most scripted. Every employee at Disney, from the custodians to the CEO, are called cast members. And you really do get the sense that they are following a script when talking to the media. And and Dave really took that to heart. He was a very loyal corporate soldier. And so I would call him to talk about the box office. Anytime I would try to sort of stray off of that, there would occasionally be a little bit of um, small talk, but it was mostly just to talk about the performance. And then a few years ago, he announced that he was leaving that job. And it was really surprising because this was not a job that people left. It was very high ranking. He was moving up in the company. He was making, in total compensation, millions of dollars. He said that he was leaving to go run his wife Rachel's self-help business. (laughs) And I think for a lot of us, it sounded like as far as euphemisms go for losing a job in Hollywood, this one was particularly creative. It was like, right. It's usually, I want to spend more time with my family. Right. And and we were told, you know, he's actually leaving. He's moving to Texas to run his wife, Rachel's company. So I, I remember looking up his wife, Rachel, and at the time she had just published a book that uh, a lot of listeners may have heard of called Girl, Wash Your Face. <laughs> and it was... I don't know what the crossover is. No. The, the Unspeakable Podcast and Girl, Wash Your Face. Although I do have... Uh, I, I had heard about this title from some friends. It's, a, a, it's, a, fair, it's a fair point. I was, I, was, I, was not, I was not necessarily saying that there's a lot of overlap between... No, no, there fans, might. I mean, it's a hugely popular and, book. I'm sure there is some overlap. Hugely, hugely popular. Yeah. Um, it had been published by a rather small Christian imprint and I think, I mean, gosh, how many books like this are published a year, right? These kind of memoir, self-help guide type things. It, But it really just took off and sold more than a million copies and really served as the, like the initial spark to build the Hollis Company into this bigger self-help empire. The the comparison that's always made when these things are starting out is like a, an Oprah 2.0 model. And so so Dave was Dave went uh, left Disney and went to Texas and and it was he was going to be kind of the the business brains. He was going to be the one who came from corporate America and helped take whatever Rachel had tapped into in the American psyche and turn it into a viable business. And for a while, that's what he did. And so the reason that I was onto this story as it was unfolding was because it was like whenever someone from your high school like gets famous for something or like has some notoriety, you have this, you feel like you have this bizarre connection and you need to sort of keep up with their career. Since I had known Dave, I can't say I knew him well. I don't think we ever even met in person. But since I had known who he was and had talked to him on the phone, I just was so intrigued by it. And then as his story, sadly, like really started to unravel, I found myself among those who was watching it unfold in real time. Okay. Okay. So what happens next? So what happens next is things start going according to plan. Dave and his his wife, Rachel, they moved to this uh, place you referenced called Dripping Springs, which is an excerpt, uh, an excerpt of Austin. It's one of the places, I'm told, where a lot of native Texans are accusing Californians of moving to and driving up home prices. You can get, obviously, big houses for much lower cost. Um, there's a lot of space to move around. And, and in some ways, what's funny is I went to Dripping Springs while reporting this story. It almost feels like a town built for Instagram. 
There are, <laughs> I mean, there are it's like a, the Truman Show of Instagram. Well, it's not even it's it's not as polished as the Truman Show, which actually is what makes it perfect for Instagram. I mean, like, right. It's not uncommon. I mean, I remember I saw there was this like a, like this cutesy apothecary store that was that was new, but it was next to a very old feed store. Or, there is okay. this like it's the, old it's the aesthetic. It's yes. the aesthetic, and and then like it might not be uncommon for you to find like a rusted out pickup truck that you could pose next to. Um, <laughs> like it just felt like there were like all these like pl- these these shots that you could see someone having yeah. fun filtering. And Dave and Rachel start building the Hollis Company into a very successful business. They start having uh, conferences called Rise. They start, um, obviously, she starts work on a second book called Girl Stop Apologizing. She's hosting uh, these Facebook uh, lives. A lot of this is be- mostly being done over social media. Um, she has products in Target. So so this is like, you know, sometimes I think it's it must be very hard, I'd imagine, to cover this industry full time as a reporter because there is, re- I mean, you are constantly dealing with people who have to present an image of success, no matter what the reality is. But it's pretty clear that this was a successful, lucrative business and that the money was pouring in. And it raises the question as to what what exactly was Rachel selling that was resonating so deeply, mostly with women. And a lot of her, I guess her brand, we could, we could call it, was that she was, there was like, there was a Christian light element to it, but it was mostly about this this sort of almost compulsive need to acknowledge your imperfections and not shy away from them. So it's like the whole sort of vulnerability thing. The Extreme kind of vulnerability. Brene Brown, right. Were they practicing Christians? They were. In fact, Dave, I remember, I remember this so vividly, and it must be 10 years ago now. I remember once calling Dave on one of those box office mornings and saying, you know, just by way of introduction, you know, saying, hey, you know, wh- what are you up to? And I remember him saying, I'm actually driving my kids back from church. And that is the first and only time anyone, I've called anyone in Los Angeles who's been on their way to or from church. And I've always, I've always thought of that. So they, they were, and, and Dave in particular was raised rather devout. And, and Rachel is the daughter and granddaughter of Pentecostal ministers. And so she actually has written quite a bit about growing up in an extremely religious and quite sheltered household um, in northern, more northern California. So they, they, um, that's what they're doing. And Dave, after he leaves Disney, becomes more and more of a character, frankly, in Rachel's story, because so much of this work requires the influencer to use their life as material. So it's, I mean, you, you know, from, from reading these books, like every, every chapter has a kind of format, like it opens with a a personal anecdote that then sort of broadens out to the the larger life lesson. You mean like in the, in the girl, wash your face. Exactly. I I, I have not. Okay. So there's, I mean, the, the idea with girl, wash your face is my impression is it's like, just do anything, like kind of just like get off of your, you know, get up and do something and do something for yourself and at least wash your face. Is that sort of the spirit of the book? It is. Although if I remember correctly, she doesn't tell you to wash your face until the very end. I I thought it was going to be a bit of a, like a a recurring metaphor, but um, she tells you at the very end to wash your face, but it is, I, I thought of it as kind of like a bootstraps feminism and, and that there's no, no one's coming to help you. No one's, no one can take charge of, your life for you. You have to do it yourself. And and the other thing that frankly, I think happens a lot with these influencers is m- not many of them, if any of them have real professional training. And so a lot of the advice I found got very recursive and it usually came back to exercise more, drink a lot of water <laughs> and practice daily gratitude. And it was oh. always, it was always like, wake up an hour earlier than usual, drink water as soon as you wake up, register for a half marathon, even if it scares you. Like, that is the kind of thing that comes up over and over and over again, you know? And and so, well, all while, while also, I think, being very comfortable leaning into like, cut people out of your life who aren't 
do, who aren't serving you. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of it's it's like a positivity. It's a combination of, I guess, like the the positivity movement, and it's almost like it's not quite visualized and you'll manifest, but it has that flavor a little bit. Yeah, there's a there's like this spectrum, and and if like total like. West Side Woo Wooism is on one end. It's like a, it's a few degrees shy of that. I think certainly there are like vision boards. It's like vision boards, but not crystals. <laughs> it's right, like right, where, right. Where and, I'd probably put it. Right. And speaking of like business experience, what was the structure of their business? Did they have like a lot of employees? What was the setup? I think at their peak, they had about 60 employees. And and they had they had employees who were you know managing their social feeds, booking these conferences. These conferences really took off, and they would be these three day events in cities across the country. And I think for for a while the structure was day one was on your past, day two was on your present, day three was on your future. And a lot of this was inspired because Rachel had attended a Tony Robbins seminar, so you can see like where the inspirations coming from. And Dave, this guy who had worked at Disney, where if there's any company where you are not the talent, it's Disney, right? Like they are all about just only putting the product, the character, the stars out front. Any executive, they definitely have like a tall poppy syndrome there. Like any executive who rises too high in in the public eye is often told to to, to get back in their place. He was increasingly a character in Rachel's narrative. He would do videos with her about, you know, how they how they work as a couple, how they communicate as a couple, how they raise their kids. And and he was also the CEO of the Hollis company. So he was running day-to-day operations. Okay. Okay. So I mean, the way you tell it in the story, there's a power dynamic between the two of them that's a little tense and and then at one point she does something where she poses in a bikini showing off her quote unquote average body was that sort of a, a pivotal moment a huge pivotal moment and but i think like it's important to note that this is the this the stretch marks post which i'm very glad you brought up that is basically what starts all of this and it happens years before dave even leaves his job at, oh, okay. at disney Rachel was, as Dave's career ascended really rather rather rapidly, Rachel had kind of cast about for a career of her own. She had tried opening an acting school. She had self-published some novels. And she had also started this events business and was running a kind of personal blog off of it as well. And I think it was in 2015, she posted a photo of herself on the beach in a bikini and there her skin her tummy's like she's she's in good shape but her her tummy's like a little flabby right, she's had and three kids she's had three say. kids she says she has like a flabby tummy and some stretch marks and she had this caption that was basically like these stretch marks are warrior marks i own them i am not ashamed to wear a bikini on the beach because this body gave me my children and my husband still thinks it's sexy and it was this like viral cry from a woman who just did not care what you thought of her. Right. She and D-G-A-F. Exactly. And <laughs> she, she, it went viral. She was picked up all over the place, Daily Mail, so on and so forth. And, and that was, I think those who know her say it's, it was when she got that, that sort of that first taste of viral fame. But it also in a really, in, in a real way led to things like the book deal that became girl, wash your face. And so the power dynamic that you described was so fascinating to me because Dave worked at Disney, which is the company where every, you know, there are no, no princess has stretch marks. No princess shows off a flabby tummy, right? It is the ultimate kind of imagination factory. Right. And here was his wife who was like really trying to push back on that culture. And so Dave, I was told in those early days and even into being CEO of the Hollis company was really uncomfortable with just the oversharing. He didn't take to it naturally, both as someone who didn't necessarily think of that as entertainment, but who also had grown up in like a pretty, you know, typical suburban home where you didn't talk about such things. Mm -hmm. And we should say she was 19 when they met, right? 
She was. Yeah, this was, I, I couldn't get as into this in, this in the story, but it was, I mean, it's a really tragic and in some ways fascinating origin story. She grew up in a small town called Weed Patch in California. As I said, her father and, gr- and grandfather were Pentecostal ministers. She, when she was a teenager, I think around 16, found her older brother dead of a gunshot wound to the head and writes about it in her book and writes about how even after her brother's suicide, her family literally painted over it, covered it up and and never talked about it again. And I just, I, I feel like the, the armchair psychologist in me would say, there's now this, this, there's been this swing toward acknowledging every shadow side of life, every imperfection, every ugly thing to, to a, to a point. And so she got the hell out of weed patch soon after that happened and graduated high school early, moved to Los Angeles and started working as a receptionist at Miramax. Okay. Because these, these are not incredibly young people. They married in 2004. So these are adults. Yes. And he's older and and Dave's a little older. He writes about how he saw himself as her protector, her provider, in some cases, her reality check, as she sort of started to see the outlines of her ambitions take shape. He he saw his role as being the person who would say, you know, well, let's see if that comes to fruition. And then, and she would later cite that as evidence that he didn't always believe in her. Okay. Okay. All right. So they, they have this thriving business. Is it at this point in the story that their marriage starts to fray? It is. It is. Because Dave is is very skeptical of this world. He sees that it's, it, they can be successful in it. And he also has a really hard time going on camera himself. I talked to one employee who said that he used to require certain clothes, certain music to be played before he would go on camera to kind of amp himself up. It just wasn't something that he took too naturally. And then there was this moment where everything started to change. And it happened at one of those conferences in Minneapolis where Dave was running around like with an earpiece in, like basically keeping the trains running as, the, as was his job. And a woman who I actually spoke to named Whitney recognized him from Rachel's videos. And she stopped him and she said, I wanted to thank you because my husband likes listening to you because he, you know, doesn't quite understand this world either and you're really helping him figure out a way into it. And and Dave said to her, I want to be relatable to the people who are married to the unrelatable. Meaning he was married to the unrelatable Rachel and he was going to be the kind of more grounded, accessible one. And Whitney, this woman who was at the conference, asked him for a selfie. And then soon after that, a line formed of other fans who wanted a selfie with Dave. and. Former employees who worked with him told me that everything changed after that. And he was much more comfortable going on camera. He was much more comfortable being a part of these conferences. And it seems like he started to, I think, A, see that he could help people. And everyone I spoke to said that he really took that seriously. But also B, that there was an inevitable kind of ego element to it as well. So interesting that relatable is the currency. Oh, it's, it is the, I I am so, you just articulated what I was trying to see myself the entire time I was reporting this was because Dave's story, which ultimately has this very tragic ending, seemed to me like it was all about how this world of influencers is exactly that. It's obsessed with showing relatability to a point. I spoke to one friend of Dave's who said that the the analogy that he drew was it's like going to someone's house and you are sitting in their pristine living room and but the door to the dining room is closed and you're sitting in the living room and everything looks pristine and they say yeah it looks pristine but oh my god we have cockroaches and you're saying oh god I've had cockroaches too oh my god I totally have been there cockroaches are the worst but what you don't know is that behind the door, the dining room is like a crime scene. Um, that it's like always about talking about the cockroaches, but not the real issue. 
And so you start to see it everywhere where like it comes down to, you know, in Dave's case, acknowledging troubles with alcohol, but not drugs. I mean, we can get into the question of whether or not it's anyone's business to share their entire lives. But like Dave had Dave had doors that he didn't open to to audiences. And I think even now you'll see like it's very common for uh, folks to they'll post a photo of their kid, you know, but the kid's not looking at the camera. It's crying. Like there's this, there's this sort of like, let's break the fourth wall, break the fourth wall, break the fourth wall to, to show just how relatable we are. Of course, I mean, we're, we, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but Rachel ends up her, her own downfall ends up coming because she rejects that notion and claims she doesn't want to be relatable. Yes. Yeah. We're, I want to, I want to get to that. There's a remarkable line to that effect, but I mean, are, are influencers, do they tend to be women? Like, I mean, I know there's a lot of male influencers out there, but it seems to me like there, it's a lot of like fitness and business and kind of money making. I mean, I guess that counts as an influencer, like, but the lifestyle thing seems very much like a, a female dominated corner of this. I think it comes in all shapes and sizes. I'm sure that it over indexes with women. But I mean, there are, I mean, I can show you some pretty terrifying accounts of uh, gay married couples who are like the, the, the gay married influencer world. Um, I mean, I talked to other, other straight men who are kind of in the Dave lane, which is like being a vulnerable man, raising good kids, but also like having a more, like a little bit slightly more professional bent a lot of the women will certainly, I think there is certainly a money-making element to it. And it's often, you know, this is the side hustle that like takes your kids to Disneyland. This is what you can do while you're also raising your kids. That's sort of the the pitch. And so, but I, but I think it's largely, and certainly with, certainly with Rachel and even with Dave, like, I don't think Dave had a ton of men who were major fans of his, like it was mostly women who who were drawn to this. Oh, okay, okay. So they were drawn to him because he was, I mean, it is such a little sort of microcosm of it's like larger discussions that people are having about like men falling behind and women sort of, you know, getting ahead in education and in business and in just sort of life in general. So like this is a guy who's been eclipsed by his wife in a way. Yes. And not even in a way for actually. So, and, and so, okay. So he's kind of trying to compete with her by being relatable where she's not relatable. She's aspirational and he's like the, the quote unquote reality. So, okay. So what does he start doing at this point? So he starts becoming more and more of a brand himself. He writes and publishes his, um, his first book called Get Out of Your Own Way. I, I can't believe that title wasn't taken already. By the way, but oh, it okay. might it very well might have been. The, the, they they had initially pitched him on a dude wash your face, <laughs> but they decided that they wanted they wanted him to ha- like carve out more of a of a lane for himself. Yeah. Um. So his his book comes out. He starts hosting his own podcast. And and the one thing you start to notice about this world, and this kind of gets to my point about how hard it can be to figure out who's actually successful in it is like it really becomes just this revolving door and and where like i i go like so if you if you and i were both influencers i would say to you at the end of this conversation okay now megan you have to come on my podcast and and also what are you going to do to promote it what well, this is what i will do to promote it like there's this there's this real kind of barter system that exists. And, and it's just like influencers talking to influencers about different self-help tips they have. And, and in Dave's case, you know, get out of your own way, followed that template that we spoke about, which was, you know, a, a mix of memoir and, and self-help guide and, but also deep, deep vulnerability. So he opens with this really telling scene of him reading the manuscript to Rachel's first book. They're on a on a vaca- family vacation in Hawaii, and she gives him the manuscript of Girl, Wash Your Face. It hasn't been published yet, but she says this is what's going to be released to the world. And in order to get through it, you know, and in order to get through the stories she shares of their lousy sex life and how poorly he treated her early in their relationship 
and just how mad she would get at him sometimes over his parenting skills or lack of parenting skills. He says that in order to even just get through the manuscript, he had to drink an entire handle of vodka to, to stomach it. And, and he opens his own book with that admission. Okay. And so he, he very quickly becomes very comfortable with the, the, the degree of sharing that's required to succeed in this world. And I have to say, a lot of folks in LA, and, and particularly people who had worked with him at Disney, are watching this like kind of aghast. Like they can't, they can't quite believe that this guy they knew is becoming this, you know, a bit of a, frankly, just like a, like a leader to, at this point now, 400,000 people. Wow. Do they think there's something wrong with him? Like, what are the conversations like sort of in, in the back channels? Are people just sort of getting together and like thinking they should have an intervention or are they like impressed with his success? I don't think they think that, I don't know if there's necessarily a call for, for an intervention because I, I don't think many people knew how unhealthy his, his off-camera life was. But when Dave would talk to, um, you know, friends from his previous life about, this new world, he would basically just kind of describe it as another job and, and say, you know, well, you know, this is, it's, this is part of it. You know, I have to, you know, post this thing that this often and, and that kind of thing. And he had a kind of, um, he had a degree of detachment. I think a degree, I think he did take it very seriously. And in some cases he took it way mu too much to heart, but he did have a, he did have a bit of a distance from it and was able to see it as a, as a business too. Mm -hmm. And is he making more money than he would have as a Disney executive? That's hard to say. I don't know. I mean, he was making sig a, quite a bit of money at, at Disney. I think whenever he and Rachel were together in building the Hollis company, there was a moment where it looked like there could have been a major windfall there that would have exceeded anything he would have made at Disney. But I think... As the two of them working together, I don't know if he's exceeding his old income. I know he's certainly helping build the business with that old income. But I think they're doing very well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to talk about their kids for a second here. So, Because I, I know the kids, or at least one of them, plays a role in a, in a pretty important moment. But like, where are the kids in this? Are they part of this scene making? Like, How old are they? What's going on with them? So um, I'm not sure. I think the the oldest is now 17, and the youngest is maybe five or six. They have three sons and one daughter. The daughter is adopted, and so a lot of their material, frankly, their books, their podcasts, and so on, uh, recounts the effort they underwent to adopt a child, which had been long and painful, and there were some some false starts that were that were pretty awful. It seems like. But the kids are all very well known to anyone who follows Dave or Rachel. They know their names. They know their hobbies. They know the oldest is into theater. One of the middle ones plays baseball. And it's very, very clear that this is basically part of the family dynamic, that vacations will be posted, you know, baseball games will be posted. And to some degree, the children will become characters themselves. And I don't know. I mean, I think in some cases, it seems like some of the kids were more into it than others. There, there were occasion, there have been occasionally times where Dave would have one of his younger sons, like kind of co-host a podcast with him or appear on video with him. Whereas some of the older ones, it seems like it was just more the occasional photo. But his daughter, the, the youngest daughter is named Noah. And she really became a recurring character in his story. She is, I should say, like, she looks like kind of like a Disney character personified. She's this adorable little girl. Very, like, I mean, I don't know if you can say a five-year-old's, like, good on camera, but very good on, very good on camera, very natural on camera. And Dave wanted to incorporate her more into his, his output. And so his employees had this brainstorming session at one point to talk about new content that they could generate for Dave. And they decided that he should host a, a weekly show called Tea Time with Noah, 
where he would host like a little tea party with his daughter and they would pretend to drink tea and they might read a story, but they would also talk about, you know, chasing your dreams and not letting anyone get you down and telling yourself. <laughs> washing your face. Does he wash, wash your face? <laughs> I, I, I never saw him wash her face. Okay. I don't, I, I think that would have, that would have sent the, okay. um, the like, wipe your face. Be like, little girl, wipe your face. Yeah, and, okay. and, and she's like being a, in some of the, vi- the videos, she's like being a four-year-old, you know, she's like falling over and not paying attention. And he's, he's trying to like say things like, you should always be yourself. You <laughs> are your best friend. Oh. And, and his, th- these like weekly tea time sessions were called tea time with Noah. And it kind of became this branded element in his life. And that is what I started to notice, Megan, when I was following him. That's what I noticed that actually I, that struck me more than anything was just how living these online lives inevitably require you to produce your own life. And so in, in this case, it was, you know, rather than just having story time with his kid, it becomes tea time with Noah. And maybe there's, and tea time with Noah goes up every Tuesday. So that's when people know to watch it. And eventually there was a tea time with Noah children's book published and, and so on. And Dave, um, when he moved to Texas, he bought himself this vintage Bronco and he would drive the back roads of, of Texas in this, in this vintage Bronco, but all of his followers knew it as the incredible Hulk. And so he would always be saying like, Hey, I'm out in the Hulk today. And and so it just felt like there was this like trademarking of anything kind of random or spontaneous in your day-to-day life. Right. And are they having somebody shoot this footage for them? Like how, how is this actually being pulled off technically? So they, yeah, they had teams basically who would record stuff. They had, I mean, obviously they would do like a lot of professional photo shoots. They, they recorded, now remember a lot of this is unfolding during COVID. So they're recording a, a lot of their things in their house, but they had, I mean, that was some, you know, their workforce of about 60 employees, a significant chunk of that were people who produced the podcast and managed the social feeds and, and so on. I mean, you have to generate so much stuff to try to break through. I mean, I, at one point I did this kind of audit of Dave's Instagram profile, and I think he was averaging like 1.4, 1.5 posts a day. And that's just on Instagram. And that's just, just on Instagram. You know, just so people are clear, I think most people are, but maybe not everybody. Like this is on the internet. Like is the, this is on YouTube, Instagram. This is not like streaming on cable or anything. This is like confined to the internet but like do they have their own channel on youtube like what's the actual medium yes i think i think it all for this demographic it mostly i'd say like instagram's the nucleus because you can post videos there you can post photos okay you can sell products through it but then you have to cover your bases so everything is posted everywhere. So it's on Facebook, it's on TikTok, it's on YouTube. But I think the demographic of their fans was probably pretty Instagram friendly. Whereas okay, but it's across platforms. We it's across, say. But, it's but across all okay, platforms. Okay, yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. So they're having to like keep up their, they're going to, they have to sort of feed the beast by living in real time as if they are 24 hour entertainment source. So, okay. And so we've got the kids doing this. We've got this marriage going on. What starts happening with Dave? So the first thing that happens is he and Rachel in 2020 go away for their wedding anniversary. And while they're at this hotel, uh, Rachel goes and takes a walk. And when she comes back, she tells Dave she wants a divorce. And it comes as a complete shock to him. Wait, is this being uh, filmed? It is not. No. Okay. No, this okay. is this Too bad. That is this be is good. not being filmed. Okay. <laughs> this is the the locked door, you know. And so, I think it's soon after that because it happens very fast. Soon after that, their employees get a Slack message from them saying we're splitting up. I mean, this is more than just two colleagues. This is the the couple whose relationship on which this entire thing has been built. Right. And only about a couple, maybe like 30 minutes after that Slack message goes out, Dave and Rachel 
simultaneously announce that they're they're splitting up. And they they announce it in these Instagram posts that that are very they're very odd because they are they put photos up of the two of them smiling deliriously. Just like looking like the happiest, most in love couple of all time. And they put in this long caption that they're still best friends. They're still going to, I think they say they're still going to work together, but that they are no longer going to be married. And very critically, Rachel writes in her caption that they had been trying to make it work for the past three years. And those three words, the past, no, past three years, four words, five words, um, they, uh, that really turns fans off because basically what it does is it calls into question all of the content they had absorbed. Yeah. That's the entire life of their enterprise. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so all the videos they posted of them being goofy together, all the kind of Valentine's day tributes, all the advice they gave about, you know, communication and making sure you're having enough sex with your partner and keeping date night alive. And all of that just starts to feel and look very fraudulent. So, but it also, in a in a very personal way, sends Dave on a real spiral. Because as friends of his put it, you know, he had once been Dave from Disney And then he was Rachel's husband, and now he was neither. And he had to very quickly figure out what he was going to do with himself. And and I think it's important to picture where he is in his life. He'd grown up in Southern California. He had made a career and a name for himself in Los Angeles. And then in the course of, you know, I think two years, he's living alone in Dripping Springs, Texas, divorced and by himself. So he really quickly falls into a deep and and pretty debilitating depression. Okay, but what is happening with their channel at this point? Are they still going through the motions? They are, but they're they're basically it's just been cleaved into two. And and Rachel's doing her thing and Dave is doing his thing. And you know, behind the scenes things are very tense, but I think to followers it seems like they are they've kind of consciously uncoupled. They can be in the same room together. They're just going to do their own thing professionally. And Dave, by that point, is all in on the influencer scene. He even has a second book coming out called Built Through Courage. So he's basically <laughs> gone da- fully down that road. Rachel, of course, has, a um, at this point, an empire to maintain. Okay, okay. So, I mean, we have a little foreshadowing here when he said that he had to drink a handle of vodka just to read the manuscript of her book. But what's happening with him just health-wise at this point? So he's he's drinking too much. And when he's when he's not on camera, he's crying. I mean, he's he's just a deeply, deeply... <laughs> that's, that's all the rage. And anyone who just... Any, anyone who's watched the, the Golden Bachelor, which which I did not watch, apparently that guy did nothing but cry. This is... This is all the rage for men in media now. So, Well, but what's interesting is, uh, I mean, I, I contrast the two because Dave was not crying on camera. I, I think Dave had was having a very hard time while also having to maintain this facade of having it all together. And he's watching as Rachel is really very quickly kind of imploding and and the company that he had helped build financially and with his expertise basically explodes in the months after their divorce whenever Rachel herself gets I'd say that I'd call it probably soft canceled okay so what happens how did that happen so one I think peril of this life is that you have to, you're on camera all of the time and when people are on camera all of the time, like, you know, something inevitably is going to go wrong. And Rachel was doing a live stream where she was talking about her housekeeper. And she referred to her as the woman who cleans my toilets. And for someone who was watching this live stream said, that makes you sound privileged and unrelatable. And Rachel fired back by saying, what makes you think I want to be relatable? 
everything I do, everything I'm trying to build is to try to be unrelatable. And she follows this up by with a uh, with a post that says she wants to be unrelatable in the way that a lot of women throughout history have been unrelatable, such as Harriet Tubman <laughs> and Malala. <laughs> and so, and I believe she writes all unrelatable AF. Yeah, unrelatable AF. I like that. Unrelatable uh, AF. Yeah, no, Harriet Tubman famously had someone cleaning her toilets. So fair enough. Okay. Well, that must have gone over well. And uh, you you can imagine. You can imagine. And this is happening, I think, I, my, I, my timeline's either late 2020, early 21. It is like, there's we're like in the middle of this, this broader racial reckoning. <laughs> and Rachel is just, has just compared herself to Harriet Tubman. And so there's just this exodus of like brand partnerships. People don't want to go on her podcast. She really grows radioactive overnight. There's a bit of a, of a side controversy when she posts a quote, I believe it's, and still I rise. And it was a bit of an allusion to her rise conferences, but people thought she was plagiarizing Maya Angelou and her poem. And so still I rise. So she was also accused of, of plagiarizing a woman of color. And so these issues are compounding and Rachel has suddenly gone from everyone's best internet friend to persona non grata. And so Dave is managing this world where the business that he had helped build is imploding, but he also has to maintain his own personal brand without basically being hit with shrapnel from Rachel's demolition. Okay. Well, she, she should have plagiarized an Emily Dickinson poem. Well, it's funny because ever since then, if you notice, this is a very common thing in the influencer world is to post these quotes. You know, I guess it's an easy, probably an easy, you know, easy couple thousand likes. And I noticed ever since then, man, are people aggressive about attribution. Oh my God. They're like, it'll be like, it'll be, so, it'll be something like, you know, be good to yourself. And then it'll just say like, it, and then it'll just say like, it'll be Einstein. Like, no, it'll be like, it'll be like unknown. You know, it'll be like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the idea too of like appropriating lines of poetry from people like Anne Sexton or, um, you know, Sylvia Plath. <laughs> just, just really, you know, depressives who, who killed themselves, you know, to, to promote your, um, your empowerment conferences. To be fair, I haven't seen any Sylvia Plath. I think I'm going to do that for mine. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to for the uh for the unspeakeasy conferences. I'm going to take the most depressive uh suicidal poets. Yeah, I'm going to get on that right now. Okay, put them, so put, all right. put the put the text like against like an like a field of sunflowers or something like that. Or just, you know, uh, an oven. You could stick your head oh in the oven. Oh my god. So this is going on. These people are melting down. What happens next with Dave? So Dave, I think, has his own breakdown not long after. And it happens at this, in this event that would later be kind of memed and referred to as Pancake Gate. So Dave himself, I'm actually making this parallel in real time. He's on a live stream too. He's sitting outside by his pool and the sun's coming up. And his book, his second book, Built Through Courage, is has just been released. And the sales are not good. And I'd heard from people I spoke to that he was really frustrated with how poor sales had been. And so he is talking on this live stream, and it's very clear that, that something is very off. And he starts yelling at the camera and, and yelling at people that he bled into the book. And that they, that if they are are so cheap as to follow him and not buy his book, not spend twenty five dollars on his book, then he doesn't want anything to do with them. And it's this really aggressive, kind of frankly unhinged performance. And then what happens is his daughter, who I'd referenced, Noah, she comes on to the the screen and she says she wants breakfast. How old is she at this I point? I think maybe I if, uh, you know, I'm I'm one of those gay men who's like never around children. She's like, I, I think this, but this is key. Like she's a little kid. Little, little kid, little kid. I'm just saying like, I, I can't tell the difference between like two months and eight, eight years old, but she's young. She's like four years, four years. Like okay, three, so she's a little toddler, little, toddler, toddler. Okay. Yeah. okay. So 
she asks him actually, and I always found this like this such an ironic detail. She asks him for Mickey Mouse pancakes, mm-hmm. and um, he says that he can't because he's talking to his internet friends. He can't make her pancakes at the moment. And at another point, he asks her to go get him his charger because his laptop's dying. She comes back. She asks him if she can have vitamins to eat, presumably because she's she's very hungry. And and people are watching this all play out in real time. And and I think one thing that's important to note is that like people were very very harsh to Dave and Rachel online, but there were also a lot of fans who really wanted Dave to kind of get his life in order. And they start telling him, you know, you need to sign off, dude. Like go have breakfast with your kids. Like this is like not nearly as important as like spending time with your kid or like getting your kid breakfast. And it really is this like undeniable kind of like messiness that's kind of spilled into public view. And people on Reddit where a lot of these fans and critics congregate, they start basically castigating Dave for what he's done and he has to issue an apology and soon after actually check himself into rehab. It kind of, in retrospect, is this like kind of first indication that something is is really off and that he needs needs professional help. And and to his credit, I, I would say maybe in, in, you know, when we're talking about, you know, relatability, right? He's quite open about how the pressures of this public life are really weighing him down and that he needs to take a break. And he basically disappears from all of these channels for several weeks. Okay. And he goes to rehab for alcohol, presumably? I think so. I'm not sure at what point he was using other substances, but he 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 basically signs off. And, you know, around this time, some of his friends, especially some of his friends from LA are like, why are you doing this? Like, you know, he has money, he has skills, right? Like he could go get another corporate job. He he also really loved do like, like the kind of one-on-one coaching that he would do with people. And they you were saying, you know, like you can do that without, rec- you know, needing to post about your truck every other hour and <laughs> stuff like that, you know? So, but I think that he really wrestled with the perks of that online life and the like the e- like as I said the sort of like the ego trip of it with the real personal strain it put him under. So after that, this I mean this story when I was writing this story it really felt like a like it was a fable because things happen. It was like one chapter after another. But Dave, uh, I think about a few months after his divorce, he's contacted by another Instagram influencer named Heidi Powell. And Heidi occupies a different kind of subgenre of influencer. She's almost entirely fitness. She hosted a show, you may remember, called Extreme Weight Loss. It was on ABC. It was, it was like a very, very dramatic show where people would go on and, and lose like in excess of 100 pounds, like an extreme amount of weight. Like more than the biggest loser. It was, a, it was like that. It was like, like, it was that extreme. It was called Extreme Weight Loss. And she now is, is an influencer on Instagram herself, does a lot of like workout videos, supplements, shakes, you know, what you should, what you should be taking, that kind of thing. And she reaches out to Dave because she herself is going through a divorce. And, and sort of similar to what I said earlier about this kind of feedback loop of influencers, she reaches out to Dave and she says, why don't you and I record a podcast together? about going through our divorces. And so she goes to Texas and they they before they can even record, they're talking and they're bonding and having this very emotional connection and they start dating. And it causes this like it's like a season finale meltdown among the followers who I have to just really reiterate like follow this like it's a soap opera. Dave and Rachel reveal their relationship on Valentine's Day in 2022. And there are even people like when they announce their relationship who are commenting like, I knew it because they figured out that Dave had been in Phoenix where Heidi lives. And like, there's, there's all this kind of um, like, it's a soap opera meets like kind of like QAnon. It's like, they, (laughs) they like will take images. They'll try to figure out what time of day something was posted. 
like they'll they'll cross reference a bunch of things to try to figure out who's in what state and what they're doing. So Dave and Heidi, it it sort of it sort of starts this new wave of frankly programming for him, where they're doing a lot of shows and podcasts together, posting a lot of things together, talking about sort of blending their families, how they he has four kids, I think she has five. So they're talking about sort of how they're managing that, going back and forth. And Dave is like, by all accounts, and the people I talk to, like quite head over heels for Heidi, but still really, really struggling. And increasingly, not just with, with alcohol, but with, with substance abuse. And at, at one point has to go back into rehab, uh, disappear from public view, but then inevitably come right back to it. Dave announces, I think this was late last year, that, and, and this, is, this is certainly sort of, I think, uh, some of Heidi's influence because she was so health and fitness oriented. Dave announces that she, he is going to start bodybuilding. And it's kind of like I said, that, that example of, you know, sign up for a half marathon just because it scares you. He says he's, he's going to try to, you know, transform his dad bod and maybe he's going to be the worst guy on stage, but he's still going to say he did it. So he starts bodybuilding. He starts getting really into fitness himself. And a lot of his content revolves around fitness, but people who live near him in Dripping Springs are seeing him, you know, buying alcohol at 7 a.m and you know looking drunk in public and and it just seems like the analogy i kept drawing to myself when i was working on the piece was dorian gray that there was this like public self that was posted but the the off camera self was just rotting more and more and he and Rach, he and he and heidi start to have uh relationship problems they're sort of they're sort of on and off as as a couple and he's frankly just really lonely. I mean, the business he left behind is is a shell of itself. The business he's building for himself is exhausting to keep up. He, by all accounts, was crazy about his kids, but is not seeing them half of the time. And he's in Dripping Springs, Texas, not near his family, not near his childhood friends, not near his Disney friends. And he just was described to me by people who were spending those final months with him as a really deeply broken man. And a week, uh, one, one night in February, he called Heidi. And, you know, one thing that she had noticed when they started dating was that Dave was really, really obsessed with what people said about him online. And, you know, in our industry, there's this adage that I frankly hate, you know, don't read the comments. Why do you hate that? I think that's a good policy. I just think it's kind of infantilizing. And this is this is a rant for another day. I, I think it's like s- stupid and a bit. I mean, it's a little bit. It's a it's a it's too easy. Yeah, it's too anyway, easy. It's, and I also think like interfacing with people who read your stuff might not be the worst idea in the world. Right, don't read uh, the YouTube comments. I think that's fair to say. Oh, OK. Fair enough. That, that, that might be the that might be the, the the middle ground we can come to. But but and there's this debate in the influencer community about what you do. Like, I mean, like because it can drive it can try it would drive anyone crazy. Right. And and the Hollis is particularly since the divorce, particularly since Rachel's cancellation, they are just fodder for so many critics. There are there are people who make a living, make money producing YouTube videos criticizing the Hollises. It's like there's this <laughs> right, like cottage right. industry. It just yeah. is like blooming and blooming and blooming. And Dave is particularly obsessed with what people on Reddit are saying about him. And Heidi calls these places the hate sites. And she would say, you know, he would look at them obsessively and he would reference them in ways that made it seem like he knew individual handles of critics. Like he was just reading it. And and everyone who who knew Dave would describe him as someone who just he he really felt a lot, good and bad. And and this criticism was really hard for him to bear. And one night in February he called Heidi because and he was very upset because his one of his sons had asked him for what he wanted for his birthday, which was coming up. And Dave said, you know, I don't want you to buy me anything. Just draw me a picture. So his son wanted to draw a picture of his dad for his dad. So he Googled Dave Hollis. And one of the first things that came up was a YouTube video 
criticizing Dave Hollis. And, and I should note, like, the criticism goes beyond, you know, why are you ignoring your daughter so you can sell your book? It also would, there's, there's also a real cottage industry of people who think this self-help is, are basically, they're basically just a bunch of charlatans who are unqualified and basically telling people to run half marathons when they should just be seeing a professional therapist or drinking water when they should be, you know, thinking about like their economic, like that it ignores like economic situations you know you know you can imagine like where where it all goes but i'm just what i just want to convey that it's not just pot shots and so his son sees this video and he watches it and he his son gets really upset and he wants to come to his dad's defense and dave calls heidi and he's really upset because i mean it's one thing for the criticism to be levied at him but now it feels like it's kind of infecting his whole family and he tells her that he wants to fight back and basically post his own video about how upsetting it was. And she convinces him not to do that, but that instead he should just flood the zone with good Dave Hollis content and drown out the haters. But nonetheless, he's still really upset. And that week it's described to me as just like a really topsy turvy time. He's, getting drunk in public, people are trying to talk to him, he's kind of shutting them down. And there's one night in February, where he gets so drunk while he's out that he has to be driven home. And before going inside, he commits to going to an AA meeting in the in the morning and church, he was going to go to both it was it was going to go to both the next day. But it appears what he did before going to bed that night was he had been drinking and he also did some cocaine not knowing that the cocaine was laced with fentanyl. And that combined with a pre-existing heart condition and stopped his heart, and he was found dead in bed the next day. That was the first hour. Yes, more than an hour has gone by of my conversation with Wall Street Journal reporter Eric Schwartzel. There's about half an hour left where we talk about why people are so invested in figures like Dave and Rachel and why in just 24 hours, Eric had more readers reaching out to him with really emotional responses than any story he's ever published. So we recorded this on Sunday, December 3rd, and the story had only been out for about 24 hours and he'd already just been flooded with responses. So to hear that part, become a paying subscriber at megandom.substack.com. In the meantime, I'll remind you that Eric, in addition to covering Hollywood for the Wall Street Journal, is the author of Red Carpet, Hollywood, China, and the Global Battle for Cultural Supremacy. What else? What do you need to know? I think that's it for now. The rest of the conversation is really good. So please, please join the listener community to hear it. Meanwhile, I'll be back next week with a special super nuanced guest. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Mm-hmm.